Um, as we look at this, now we're shifting gears into the second letter to Timothy, which is written at a much later time in Paul's life, and it gives some very important final warnings, if you will, and tips on how to serve uh, the truth in these last few words. Uh, they were inspired and delivered to Timothy for his own personal benefit, that's for sure, but they were also circulated in the first century ecclesia and ultimately, ultimately preserved for our edification so their value is beyond to the individual. They include one of the most famous verses in scripture, at least in Christadelphian circles, uh, in verse, chapter 3, verse 16, as well as a capstone to one of the most tender relationships you and I have the chance to see at the judgment seat as we look at his final words in chapter 4. Um, so we'll, we'll get that to that tomorrow. So the second letter starts similar to how he starts the first. He uh, refers to himself as Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. So he calls himself apostle, same thing he does in the first letter. It's not like Timothy didn't know what his job was. But there is a difference. In the first letter, he refers to the commandment of God as his authority. And notice the change. Here, it's the will of God. So it's a change that his backing the, the, what's backing him is not a command given by God he's passing on on how they're going to establish ecclesias, but now by the will of God, he's given an opportunity to give him one last letter, which, by the way, this is the last letter Paul wrote. The last recorded words of Paul is what we're going to be reading today and tomorrow, which means if it sounds a little like a dying man trying to help his family before his time is up, it's because it is. Uh, he knows he's on trial, sentenced to death, and he knows how this is going to end. So here's his, if we want to get an idea of the last things Paul was able to put to paper before he died, that's what this is. So the fact that Paul's given this opportunity is a, a support of it being the will of God that he even had this chance to write just one more letter. Um, it's important for us as growing leaders in the meeting to make sure we are aligned with God's will and not the other way around, trying to align what we think God's will might be to what we're trying to do, but rather let God's will guide us. The only way we can do that, prayer and reading. It gets us back to where the foundation of the first letter is. And so there'll be a lot of references back to that material um, because it's a springboard. I think I made the comment earlier about God not being our personal concierge. Did I say that here? I've said a lot, so I don't know what I've said in what room. No? I got You've heard me say it. Did I say it in this room? they got a few people doing that. You don't even know what a concierge is. Well, this is fun. Okay. So back in the olden days, when you went to a hotel, there'd be somebody that greeted you. And they might, it might even happen at a, a, a fancy restaurant. And they try to they take your order. And their job is to make sure your experience at their place of business is awesome. That is not our God's job. God is not our personal concierge. We don't call him up and say, hey, God, here's what I need. Here's my checklist like we're giving him our grocery list. Make sure this happens for me, will you? That's not how our God works. That prayer is really for us, not for God. He knows what we need before we even ask. So... We have to make sure that we're letting God dictate what we do, not that we're trying to dictate to God what we think he should do. And it's a subtle difference, but it is a very big difference. We have to make sure we serve the God that is, not a God we want. Instead of trying to create a God, which effectively goes back to the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, we have to make sure we understand intimately who God is, and then align our life to his path. Does that make sense? Except for the concierge word part, you're with me. Good, okay. So to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, peace from, the God, from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord, I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. So, Dearly beloved, same thing uh, referred to where God called Jesus. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That's Matthew 3 and 17, same word. Uh, so the literal Greek for thank is have mercy. So he sees this opportunity to serve as mercy from the Father. Think about that. It's all about perspective. Where is Paul when he's writing this? He's in prison. 
Now he's been given the opportunity to have visitors, so that would have softened the blow. But nonetheless, prison is prison. So he's in prison, and he knows he's sentenced to die, but yet he finds the mercy of God in his circumstance. You and I could put ourselves in prison knowing we're sentenced to death. Would it be easy to be focused on, God gave me the mercy to have this hope and share it with you? Amazing perspective. Gives us a little bit of insight to the way Paul looked at things. Um, Now, forefathers, that's the only time this uh, uh, word is used in this letter. And the only other time it's used in the Bible is 1 Timothy 5 and 4, where it was translated parents. The name really means ancestry. So let's dive a little deeper there. Uh, Acts 22, verse 3. I am verily a man, which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city of Cilicia, brought up in the city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous towards God, as you are this day. So we know the story. We talked about this at the beginning of the class. But in fact, look at verse 20. He's going to add a detail for us. So he says, I had a zeal, and here's a case in point. I, when the blood of the martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by, consenting unto his death, and kept the raiment of them that slew him. I know we talked about this a little bit, but we're going to see that story, both the, the road to Damascus, when Jesus appears to him uh, on the road to Damascus, and the stoning of Stephen, become two stories that literally haunt Paul throughout his entire ministry. And we can see at the end of his life, he's going to have Stephen and Jesus directly on his mind. Um, We'll look closer when we get to chapter 4, but even in this intro, we can see evidence that he's got Stephen on his mind. Uh, In Philippians 3, he he adds to this list of his heritage that he was circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of the Hebrews, touching the law of Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting persecuting the ecclesia, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. So he had a good resume on that account, but yet when he looked at his own life, he was humbled by the fact that Jesus chose to call him out to make him one sent to the Gentiles and the constant reminder of what he did to, see, to Stephen. Uh, so now we have his conviction. Let's go back to uh, 2 Timothy 2 again. I thank God, whom I serve from my forefathers with a pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. A pure conscience only comes from repentance and forgiveness. And you've got to start with yourself. If you can't forgive yourself for your mistakes, it is very hard to forgive other people. So we've got to understand the concept of forgiveness. Forgive ourselves for our falling short and work towards the glory of the Father, take the the opportunity to fix it and move ahead. The giant eraser is something all of us would like. All of us can look back at our life and go, boy, I wish I could just pull that part out. And we can't. The mistakes we have made and the the victories we've had make us who we are today. And sometimes the mistake that you are the most embarrassed of in your life becomes something that motivates you to either humility or to try to improve or perhaps to learn from that mistake so you never go down that path again. And I think that's partly why we have errors that we remember so that we get a chance to see ourselves in weakness and in strength to put our life in perspective. There is no giant eraser that can erase the errors of our past. So it's up to us to put them in their proper place, learn from them, and let them be something that helps us keep in tune with the the thinking of our Father. Uh, Without ceasing, the only other one is Romans 9 and 2, where it says, I have a great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. So this is perpetual. We want to perpetually remember those we are working with in the meeting. And that's, of course, as he's referring to praying night and day for Timothy. So the question then is something for us to ponder is, What do we remember continually in our prayer? Do our thoughts regarding the ecclesial family give us a pure conscience? The concept is pretty simple, but the application is a little bit harder. We need to forgive, and we need to change. We learn how to forgive ourselves, see our eyes through the eyes of the Father. We then can take that application and forgive others because we know our weakness, you know yours. 
And if I know mine, and I know how the Father sees mine, and I can reconcile that, I know God's working in your life too. I just don't get to see it at the same level I get to see mine own. Recognizing that God's working in the lives of others allows us to put their mistakes in the proper place, the same way we want our God to put our mistakes in theirs as well. That's really Paul's example. See, Paul had a big change he had to make in his life. Imagine he's going down the road on the way to round up another family and maybe persecute or kill another Christian. And he's, a giant timeout happens. And imagine Paul now has to come to the conclusion the facts of the Bible he's got right, but this one big detail was missing. And effectively, everything you thought you knew about the love of God is wrong. And now he has a choice. Change course and follow God's way or continue on the path that he thinks is right. Thankful for us, he saw the wisdom in what Jesus was trying to do and he was humbled by it. And the life of Paul was not an easy life from this point. As we read about shipwreck, you know, beaten with a few, uh, beaten, stripes, uh, being, spending a lot of his time in prison. The ecclesia he was serving, the Jewish ecclesia was afraid of him. So he went and served the Gentiles. What did he do when he, to help the Jewish ecclesia? Because he was not a help to them primarily. He couldn't just go in and be a welcome member. What did he do to help them because he couldn't be there in person? What's that? He did send Barnabas. He did send help. And I think he wrote the letter to Hebrews. So he certainly did what he could to help him. But he did something specific to help his relationship with the Jerusalem ecclesia. Ever heard of the Jerusalem Poor Fund? See, what Paul did as he established ecclesias in Gentile areas, some of the Gentile converts had means. They were wealthy. You'll see a lot of times we're talking to places like in Corinth where he's really talking about the proper use of wealth. Well, one of the things he did is he would take up a collection from those Gentile ecclesias that he was establishing to send it back to help the poor ecclesias in Jerusalem. So... It almost reminds you of David. He was told, you can't build my house. You're a warrior. So does David go, oh, well, too bad. No. He collects, he, he raises funds for it. He collects the material for it. He does the drawings for it. He did everything he could so that, who, so that when his son came along and was allowed to build it, he could go, here, I've done as much as I can to give you a head start. That's the concept. So Paul changes everything to become right before his God, including, as we mentioned earlier, his name. And he becomes little, which is a sign of humility, that he can become glorious in the kingdom. So, greatly desiring to see thee, he says to Timothy, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which first dwell in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that it is in thee also. So, he recalls times in his ministry where Timothy was his companion. And imagine if you're a guy in prison and you're writing to a guy that used to go with you everywhere you went, that tenderness you would share and how much you would miss that. So imagine someone that may be your best friend or someone you're very close to. You do a lot together and now you are forced to be set apart. You would constantly remember the joy that was set before you. And now he makes reference to tears, not of his own, but of Timothy, that I am mindful of your tears. So he knows that it's not just hurting him that they're not together, but it's been a challenge for Timothy too. Now, this unfeigned word, the RSV has sincere, sincere faith. It's translated without hypocrisy in James 3 and, and 17. So <clears throat> this sincere faith that you have takes root in your mother and your grandmother. And those are some of Timothy, uh, Timothy's foreparents, as he mentioned. And notice the influence of women on his life. So we looked at that first letter, and we talked about the roles of women in the meeting, the roles of men in the meeting. Here, here he has an opportunity, and he makes sure that we have the name of his mother and grandmother. Again, a seemingly insignificant detail, but it's honorable to Timothy, the life that Timothy is leaving, uh, lit, uh, leading is honorable to his mother and his grandmother. A faithful mother and grandmother set the stage for his service to the bride. Now we notice the absence of a father. Acts 16 and 3 tells us his father was Greek. That was the main course of the circumcision issue in the first century. 
and it is likely that he never came to the truth, which also helps explain why Paul's influence as a father in the meeting was so important. The value of relationships and the truth is, is astounding. It gives us a chance to get to know each other so that we can be there during the highs and lows. Right now, some of you in this room are having a very difficult time spiritually. You feel disconnected from your God. I don't know who you are by name, but I am sure there are some people in that position right now. There are others of you that right now probably feel closer to God than you ever have in your life. Here's the good news and bad news. Those feelings are going to do this your whole life. You're going to have times when you're on a spiritual high and it feels like you're very connected to, to the Father and you're enjoying the work of developing your character towards the kingdom. And then there's going to be the spiritual lows where going to meeting is hard. Forcing yourself to do the readings is a challenge. You might even find yourself lowering the content or quality of your prayer because you're getting farther and farther away from your God. This is the beauty of relationships. Me, coming in from a 1,500 miles away, I don't know this, or I don't know what it looks like when you're here. Some people are having the spiritual time of their life, and they look sad. They're not sad. They just look it. But if you know who they are, you go, hey, that's just how they look. I know they're happy. That's the value of the relationship. Because if you and I are close, and I see you're struggling, well, maybe I'm on the spiritual high, and I can go, look, I know where you are. I, that was me last year. We're going to get through this together. I love you and I want to help you. Same thing can happen the other way. That same person you lift up in their time of trouble, they might be there when they see you're struggling. So you will understand these on both sides of that coin. Having people you love and trust working together towards the kingdom will help you both in the highs and in the lows. All right. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Uh, the, the Greek for this, uh, stir up, is to enkindle or inflame. The RSV says rekindle. It's a, a reigniting uh, of the power. Now the gift is the word charisma in the Greek. Uh, so realistically it was referring to the power of the Holy Spirit then, but that app applies to us. We all have our gifts. We all have things that our God has given us that make us unique. So what we need to do is when we get down, somebody that can help reignite us to put that gift in action puts us back in a zone where we are not only feeling the benefit of the glory of the Father, but we're benefiting the household of God at the same time. So that reigniting that flame is something we can do for each other. Uh, and that's something that, that I think he's referring to, although it is noted specifically the, the power of the Holy Spirit is what he meant specifically, but it applies to us as well. Verse 7, God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So we're not supposed to be afraid of God. We're supposed to fear his wrath. There's a value in that. But if we're truly afraid of God, we do not know him because our God is a God of love. We want to understand the love of the Father, the power of the Father, and maintain a sound mind, or as the RSV says, self-control, based on the work of the Father. These are great leadership attitudes. If we can maintain love and self-control with humility, are we not setting ourselves up for the opportunity for our God to make that work glorious? Again, building on language from the first letter. So... Be not thou ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given him in Christ Jesus before the world began. So this is not a reprimand for past failures, but a warning against future ones. So every one of us has sinned and fallen short. Are we going to sin again? It's coming. We may as well prepare ourselves for it and do what we can to prevent it, yes, but when it happens, there is a cycle that he is reminding him of. We have to learn from our mistakes. If we keep making the same mistake over and over again, we're not getting the lesson. Make a new mistake. Make, make sure that the lesson from the last one we learn, we incorporate, so that we've mastered that skill and there will be another problem that comes along to refine our character even, even further. If we feel like we're having the same problem over and over again, that's the opportunity for us to kind of hit our own pause button and go, 
okay, this seems to always happen to me. What am I doing? Where is my problem? Where is my failure? Not, why are they doing this to me? Because you can't fix anything as a victim. But what am I doing to create the environment that keeps letting this happen? Then we can reflect. We can change the only person we have any control of, which is me. I can learn the lesson, and then God can provide a new one for me to work on. He adds the prisoner detail, which we mentioned earlier. We talked about Philemon a little bit, and we found it also in Ephesians. Now, sharing in the suffering of the gospel is something Paul and Timothy both intimately understood for different reasons, but they both were suffered at the hands of the first century ecclesia. Now, this is not a generic, you know, I've had a hard day. This is specific with reference to serving the body of Christ. Paul, uh, certainly because of his background, and Timothy because of his half-breed status as a Greek, uh, which was highlighted when he was uh, amongst the Jewish, the Jewish family. Now, the literal blue at the end of verse 9 literally means time of the ages, which was given us in Christ before the time of the ages. God has had a plan to fill this earth with his glory. He wants to dwell with his family forever. And he has had that plan since the creative work of Genesis chapter 1. So it's a critical perspective for us to keep in mind that God is working in my life and yours to bring about his ultimate glory. And recognizing that I will stumble on my way as you will stumble on your way, working together we can arrive together to the kingdom of our Father. God does the calling, not based on things you and I see, not the criteria we might use, but it's based on his purpose. It's not our value, it's his value that he's trying to further in this cause to fill the earth. But now, being made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light in the gospel, dot, dot, dot. So this immortality or incorruption is the same word that's used, it's translated incorruption in 1 Corinthians 15. It's probably worth looking there, so let's do that. 1 Corinthians 15, which is the only place in the Bible that we get what happens after the thousand-year reign of Christ. Verse 50 says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Same word. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. When this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Think of how Paul would be comforted by those words and consoled as he's a prisoner waiting for execution. The, the death will be swallowed up in victory when the mortal puts on immortality. That seems a long time away for all of you, doesn't it? Words like this probably mean a lot more to your grandparents because they see their time approaching much more keenly than you do. It's all about perspective. It's important for us in our trials and times of distress to see our way out of it. Yesterday we talked about see the rock, hit the rock. It's the same idea. Looking past the problems of today to see the glory of tomorrow. Paul continues, Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle, a teacher of the Gentiles. For the which cause I also suffer these things. So he knows why. It's not a mystery to him. I suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. That green is the word in the Greek, a deposit or a trust. So think of this as a spiritual bank account. He know he has suffered for the sake of Christ. He, know what he, he knows what he has done since his calling on the road to Damascus and how his life has changed and how much he has invested in the ecclesial family. And he trusts that all of his work and service out of love will be accounted for at the judgment. That is living faith. The best example of how we live is our best preaching tool. It is not what we say. In fact, Jesus said it that way. In Matthew 5, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And not just, oh, Dennis is a good guy, but glorify the Father which is in heaven. The purpose of our light shining is not so we look good. It's to, in some small measure, show 
to someone around us the glory and love of the Father by how we behave. Now let me ask you this. How many of you have heard light? Oh good, because sometimes I have to explain that. You don't hear light. You see light. And I think that's a valuable lesson. Jesus doesn't say, go around and preach these words. He says, be the light. Because if who you are is not matching what you say you are, nobody's hearing you anyways. Being the light of the world is be an example in behavior and attitude. Because if I'm an example in behavior and attitude, you might want to know, what, Dennis, you're a little bit different. Why? Or you seem to have a different perspective here. Why? See, when they see you as different, they might be curious as to why. Is it everybody? No, God does the calling. Many are called, but few are chosen. So we're not out to figure out who should I be a light to. Just get your life in order so you're an example to those around you. And if you are, you are living the truth and you are actually preaching that by the way you behave. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. A good thing, that good thing that was committed unto thee keep by the Holy Spirit which dwelleth in us. So uh, the word form, only other time that was used is when it was translated pattern in the first letter, verse 16, chapter 1. So effectively he's saying what the RSV says, follow the pattern of sound words. Since all, that, uh, since all of us do what's right in our own eyes, society watches helplessly as standards are disregarded and people are looking to the flesh for answers. It becomes diluted and eventually defiled. Now, this will get some more time tomorrow when we talk in chapter 4, but it's an underlying theme in the letter of how the world is going one direction and we need to hold fast in faith and love. Now, the word committed, same thing we saw in uh, 1 Timothy 6 and 20, where he's told, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding faint, profane and vain babblings, uh, oppositions of science falsely so-called, where we ended yesterday. It, the word to trust is added in the English translation. We are all entrusted to keep the truth alive in our hearts. Then our families, then our ecclesias, so that we can be prepared to fill the earth with his glory. Now, notice at the end, when he makes this reference, this separate power, which is what the Holy Spirit means, this separate power of trust and truth dwells within them and should dwell within us. And we have another reference to the tabernacle. This thou knowest, that, they all, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom uh, Phygelus and Hermogenes, you guys glad your parents didn't name you that, the Lord give... <laughs> Did your parents name me? Did I just pick on your brother and didn't know it? No. Okay, good. The Lord give me unto the house of Onesphorus, for he hath oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. So he's not ashamed of my bonds. Now, uh, this Phygelus guy, his name means little fugitive. And uh, Hermogenes is born of Mercury. Perhaps they were both converts, as we suggest perhaps in verse 11. So it's possible that these were ones that knew and learned the truth perhaps even by the work of Timothy. And in verse 16, it's a contrast to the individuals that left is the faithful house of Honest Forest. So Honest Forest standing firm, and these other two learned and left. Now, the name means bringing profit, and the only other one used in Scripture is chapter 4 and 19, where he wraps up his salutations. We'll see that tomorrow. Refreshed. Uh, the only other time that uh, the only time that word is used is right here, and I like to compare it to Matthew 25, where we talked about a little earlier this, this week. Jesus, if I knew you needed a sandwich, I would have given you one. The point is the context of Second Timothy is Onus Ferris was not deterred. He was not deterred by going to the prison and help the brother who needed help. He was not held back by the surroundings, but rather. He did what he could to ease the burden of Paul and stay close to the, the ecclesia. He could have made a number of excuses, but he did not. In verse 17, he says, But when he was in Rome, he sought me out diligently and found me. So he didn't make excuses not to help and support Paul, but he looked at it as an opportunity to uplift Paul. 
which is a wonderful feeling for someone towards the end of their life where they've dedicated their life to uplifting others in the meeting, to have that opportunity for someone coming along trying to help uplift them toward the end of their service. I like to compare this to our efforts to find opportunities to serve in the meeting. It's one thing to say, hey, can you do this? That opportunity found you. You didn't go find it. What can we do when we look around our meeting and say, how can I help this family? What can I bring to the table that will help this family? And then, whatever it is you find to do, if it's within your skill set, do it. And you'll enjoy the process of knowing that you are helping because it's not only helping the body, but it is refining your character. So that's the example we get from Honest For Us. And the picture, if you're trying to figure that out, I use that as an example of children. And perhaps you guys are old enough that this doesn't apply to you, but you will remember it well. You ever been told by mom or dad, hey, can you go find this? And then you make this really big search like, I just did, I don't know where it is. And then your mom walks in the room and goes, oh, you mean this? Right? Has that ever happened to you? you oh, I, I searched high and low. I could not find it. You mean that? Oh, yeah, that. Well, it happens. The point is, there are opportunities for you to serve everywhere you look. If you're getting in the cushions and looking. Now, if somebody says, hey, I lost my phone in the sofa, you go, well... I don't know, I see it. If it's your phone you lost in the sofa, you've torn it apart because you know we've got to find it. You know the difference between major surgery and minor surgery, by the way? Uh, major surgery is when it happens to you. See, you might have, oh, that little uh, outpatient heart uh, transplant. They do that so fast these days with modern science, but then you've got like a little pinky toe needs to be removed. Surgically, it was a, I could barely walk for days. Because in our mind, it's bigger, and we minimize the pain of others. Imagine if we can flip that around, how much different our perspective would be. All right, verse 18. The Lord grant uh, unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And in how many things he manifested unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. So it's obviously a reference back to Onesphorus, which the language of this suggests by this time he might be dead, as it's written. So it's a look back, and though he may not be there, uh, apparently his life was a testimony of service, and that's how the labor to serve was not forgotten. So the question for us is, who is writing or even thinking about us in our prayers right now? about being thankful that God has delivered you or I into their life to help serve the body of Christ. Who are we thinking about in our prayers that we thank God that brother or sister so-and-so is a part of our life to help make sure that we walk towards the kingdom? So we've got three crowns in Scripture. We've got the crown of thorns, a past, a crown of gold, tried faith. You guys didn't know how get purity of gold. You've heard the story where you bring it to a boil and all the yuck comes to the top, you scrape it off and what's left is a pure version of gold, pure version of gold. That's why it's used to talk about faith, problems in our life, get a chance for us to live our faith. The junk comes up, it becomes obvious. Hopefully we scrape it off and learn a new one. We don't just stir it back in and do it again. But the third one is the crown of life. And that's what we need to look forward to. That's the space between the rocks, the opportunity to be kings and priests as the bride of Jesus forever. Jesus is our pace car. He's the one we are following. He's the one that has shown us a way from the crown of thorns, literally, trial of his faith, literally, to receive the crown of life, literally. Now, the rest of this letter is really an exhortation. So first we'll look at the specifics of what he exhorted Timothy to do in his absence, and then we'll try to elevate that to what it means to us as we apply it in the last days as we see our Lord's return approaching. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So we must start from a place that it's worth it. Do you do anything well that doesn't matter? Do you, I mean, if it really doesn't matter and nobody cares, does it make you go, I gotta do this really well? For most people, if nobody cares, we don't put a whole lot of effort into it. But if you know you're going to be inspected, 
hey, I know I was told if my room's not clean, I'm going to be grounded. It's going to get checked. Do you usually do a better job than when you're just doing it because, hey, I'm tired of looking at the filth on my floor? The concept is that it's got to be worth it helps us pay the price because you will not pay the price for something that has no value but you'll pay a high price for something that does have value start from the perspective that serving in the meeting to have my character refined that I might be part of the family of God forever has to be worth it and if we keep that in our perspective it makes it easier when the trials come in our life because they will life in the truth is not easy life battling our natural inclination to serve ourself is harder than just surrendering to it. Recognizing that's what it's going to be, it has to be worth it for us to keep the battle going. There is no such thing as a life without consequences. Even if we disregard God and his laws, we're still bound by them. Being in a world of darkness, but longing to represent that which dwells in the light, is critical to our separation from the world and preparation for the crown. Now, fair warning, this is the longest chapter in the second letter. There's a lot, a lot of meat in it, so buckle up. We're going to drive in. Um, what qualification do these brethren have? Verse 2, faith. They have faith. Commit thou to faithful men. They had to be faithful as a prerequisite to teach. 1 Timothy 3 lists a summary of qualifications to lead in the meeting, which we looked at a lot, and we referenced a lot to Titus. It's repeated because it's important. Uh, now, we're going to move on specifically to the individual labor. Thou, therefore, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Endure, as translated in the RSV, share the suffering. Same thing we saw, uh, uh, same thing that we'll see in verse 9 and also in chapter 4, verse 5. Now, the, the point of the soldier is the soldier's not alone. The soldier's not sent out to battle as a one-man band. The soldier is, sent, is part of a group with a uniform goal that they are going to orchestrate together. And if they work well together, each involving their individual strengths, they can achieve the mission. So it's interesting that he uses that. Uh, we compare it to the athlete, which we'll see in verse 5, and the farmer we'll see in verse 6, where some athletes work together in a team sport, other athletes work alone. The farmer is generally working on his own. Now, the soldier needs to follow the direction from a commanding officer and coordinated effort with like-minded officers or like-minded soldiers to be successful on the field of battle. So he's putting this into perspective. You've got to work together with others to be able to achieve this because one is too small a number to do anything great. This and the next two verses are going to point out we have to be balanced and capable of leading in unity, but retain our individual responsibility to get ourselves right first. So get myself right before my father and work with others that are trying to do the same so we can coordinate our efforts as we serve the body. No man that warreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him that have chosen him to be a soldier. RSV says it this way, no soldier on service gets entangled in civilian pursuits. So if, if we're sending out soldiers to war, it's kind of nice to know that the guys that we're counting on to lead us to victory don't have that as a part-time job. But, you know, I'd like to go take this city, but instead I have to go home. i got to take out the trash. i got an important job to do. The soldier has to entangle themselves not with the things of this life, but with the commands of the officer uh, or the pursuits of this life versus the commands of the officer. So that word in blue at the end is actually one so word soldier. It, it means, uh, it does mean soldier. The RSV ends that with the one who enlisted them, which makes it easy to see Jesus, that we are called by Christ. We don't do the calling or enlisting. God does the calling. We must put his objectives for the overall benefit uh, above our own, as we saw throughout the cha first chapter. If a man strive for mastery, yet he is not crowned, except he strive lawfully. So the word strive, those are the only two times that's word. The word is used in the New Testament. It's the same word, and it means to engage in a contest. This is the athlete we're talking about. So the individual has to learn and prepare. We have to receive coaching. We have to be receptive to correction and improvement. That's ecclesial life. The athlete that shows up and says, I got this, you don't have to teach me anything, might have some natural ability and do pretty well on their own eventually. Everybody that gets to professional sports is good. Even the guy that plays two minutes a year and sits on the bench most of his time. 
He is good. He wouldn't be there if he's not. The difference between the person with natural ability that excels and the person with natural ability that does not, oftentimes, is not the ability, but the effort to refine that ability. And so, Paul is appropriate in using the athlete for us as an example in ecclesial life, because if we come to the meeting, and we've got a few gifts, but we never let them be put to service in the meeting, they never get to be developed and grow. And the more we let our gifts be developed, the better off we are to the service of our Father, and the more valuable we are to the helping of the body. The athlete has to have an awful lot of practice. The ratio of practice to game time is significantly different. Because the person that doesn't practice doesn't normally perform very well in the game, especially when they're learning the skill. Mastering the skill is more repetition, but learning the skill, there's a lot of time put in for a very short contest. Imagine being a sprinter in the Olympics. Your, your game is over in 10 seconds. How many hours and hours and hours are put in to make sure those 10 seconds are maximized? RSV says it this way, an athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules, because you get caught cheating, they take away the crown. All right, we already mentioned the crowns, so here's a good verse for that. Uh, Hebrews 2, verses 7 and 9, uh, comparing us to Jesus, who was made a little lower, lower than the angel, and now having uh, overcome the suffering of death, at verse 9, crowned with glory and honor. It's our, our duty to know and master the things of the truth and then apply them by practicing them in the ecclesial setting. That gives us experience to develop our character. So effort plus information equals blessings by God. So he's used the, the soldier, the athlete. Now he's using the husbandman or the farmer in our, our language, our modern terms. That laboreth must first be partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say and give the Lord and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Now, the farmer has to be patient in the field. What would you call the farmer that went out, tossed a little bit of seed, went to bed, gets up in the morning and goes, hey, where's my harvest? What do we call that guy? Well, dead is what you call him because he's not going to survive. He's got no food. You have to be willing to work the ground, prepare the ground, put the right seed in, tend to the seed, add water, and time. We are crockpot people, not microwave people. God does not say, ooh, Dennis, you need an improvement. Zap, there it goes. But rather gives us time to marinate and learn and grow. It's a marathon, not a sprint, using the language from the first letter. So the farmer example has to plant today to harvest in the future and have patience between those two points. Jesus uses the same concept at the parable, uh, we, we, the parable of the sower, does he not? Call, Paul goes a step further to focus our individual efforts on the task at hand to feed the family. Reading, studying the word of God takes time and effort. We do not read a verse and master it overnight. It takes time and effort. The results are not immediate. But we need to continue to tend so that we can harvest. Let's look at the next slide, because the word understanding in verse 7 is this word that we've highlighted in green. Colossians 1 and 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and desire that you might be filled with the knowledge, and that's a precise and correct knowledge, of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That word understanding uh, in the Greek means a running or flowing together like two rivers. It's used seven times in the New Testament. So now we're getting a word picture. It's not enough to be smart or to be educated, just to have a good mind. But we must be filled with the precise and correct knowledge of his will. So that our will can flow into the will of the Father like a river merging out of two. And that's the picture. That's what it is. If we have a precise and correct knowledge of the things of the Father... Our wisdom can now work with God's wisdom to achieve understanding like flowing of two rivers into one. It's kind of a neat picture. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my, uh, according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Our Lord's greatest example of enduring hardship is the crucifixion. 
And that's in sh what's translated, I suffer troubles, translated endure hardship in verse 3. Now the evildoer, just in case you, we, we want to make sure we know Paul is focused on the crucifixion, there are only three other times that word is used in the New Testament, and all three of them are in the crucifixion. It's Luke 23, verse 32, 33, and 39, all translated the malefactor, talking about the thief on the cross. We also note that the thief on the cross was not too late to be saved. You know, the one person that Jesus lost amongst his twelve was Judas, was it not? And John tells us a specific detail about Judas that the other gospel writers don't. When Judas said, that ointment could have been sold to the poor and we could have put the money in the bag. And John says, did anybody know it? He saith not because he cared for the poor, but he was a thief and carried the bag. Now, Judas Iscariot, the thief, took his own life. And we're told he will not be in the kingdom. It was better that he had never been born. But the lesson we get from the thief on the cross is Jesus was not beyond forgiving a thief. Had Judas repented, he could have been received back into the family. Because the last person Jesus forgave before he died was the thief on the cross. Verse 10, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal, eternal glory. And that elect's sake is the word translated chosen in the phrase we've said a number of times. Many are called, few are the elect or chosen. Now, may obtain literally in the Greek means to hit the mark. So in the first letter we talked about missing the mark and use that as an example of the Hebrew term for sin. Now, it's missing the mark, that they would hit the mark, which would be salvation, as opposed to missing the mark and having sin. It's a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. So, same concepts that we've been looking together. Associate our life with the life of Jesus, with his life, with his death, with his suffering. Because if we do that, we can partake in eternal life with him and the Father, reigning as kings and priests. Another nice reference to the tabernacle. You've got to love it. All right, verse 13. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them that are before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. So this is to betray a trust like the unfaithful from verse 12. So he's testifying, is what the word charging means, testifying before the Lord. Striving about words, Thayer says to wrangle about trifling matters. Of course, that's something that can plague the ecclesia. We ought to be careful that's not us. Uh, prophet, only time that word's used, and it means to be fit or useful. So if we want to be fit for use and useful to God, we can't waste our time trifling about words that don't matter, but rather focus on the words of life. That's what does matter. The word subverting, the Greek, is catastrophe. In fact, the only other time that word is used is regarding Sodom and Gomorrah, translated overthrow in 2 Peter. I love this verse. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the work of truth. This is a very popular verse in the, in the Christadelphian world, and, and it's well and good that it should. It's so powerful. Let's look at it carefully. Study which is also translated endeavor, labor, diligence. The focus is work. Put work into the work of God. Rightly divide, or to cut straight, to cut it right. First, we gain God's approval. Our focus is not the approval of men. Jesus says if they want the praise of men, they've got their reward already. But cut it straight before the eyes of the Father. And once we do that... Respect of the ecclesia comes, not reverse order. It avoids the itching ears part from the first letter. Uh, and we'll address that a little bit later. The only way to avoid shame is to work to understand and then get it right. We can't just divide the truth. We have to divide it properly. Shun vain and, uh, excuse me, profane and vain babblings. They will increase in a more godliness. We talked about this in the first letter as well. It was a theme, the profane theme we saw three times and used Esau as our reference point. And their work will eat them as it doth a canker, of whom is Hymenus and Philetus. So now we're, we're bringing back to a, another couple guys. We've mentioned Hymenus before. And now this canker, which the RSV says gangrene, 
is what these people have become in the truth, who concerning the truth have erred, saying the resurrection is past already and overthrew, overthrow the faith of some. False doctrine is most dangerous when it starts from within the household. Remember the wolf with the sheath's clothing? That's the same idea. When they look like wolves, we're not afraid. It's when they look like sheep, they become dangerous, which is what he's referring to. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, that the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. The word knoweth, this is the intimate word. So we've talked about this word before. Intimately know that they are his. This is translated, the word name is translated call. The context is for the brethren. The meeting, we have been called to away from serving our own lust to serve the Father. The key is to make sure that we keep that application, that we might have the seal of the Father. First, we want to make sure we, we stay true to our first love, that we worship no other God than the God of Israel, including our cell phone, our car, the house, our nation. There are a lot of things can become a God in our life. Anything that's tied to self-interest and what I think is important can become a God. We ourselves can become our own God if we buy our own hype. If we can abstain from those things, we can focus on the things of the Father because not all Israel is of Israel. Reflect, own the part that's not right, and then work on that to fix it. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, those are the ones that get all the attention, ooh, because they're shiny, but there's also ones of wood and stone, some to honor, some to dishonor. All these vessels are useless if they have nothing in them. A vessel of air is useless, just like you and I. No matter what our vessel is, if it's filled with the glory of the Father, it can be used to the working in the service of the truth. The material things of this life don't matter. It's filling this life with the things of God. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. So we purify the ecclesial family by starting with my own thinking and my own actions aligning those to the will of the Father and spend the rest of our efforts rightly dividing the word of truth and living a life that shows we understand it. So he ends with flee from useful lusts. Follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, and them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing they do engender strife or breed quarrels as the RSV says. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, and patient. These are good leadership qualities we focused on in the first book, or first letter. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, uh, which sounds a little bit weird. Well, good, the RSV says it a little differently. Correcting his opponents, if God peradventure would give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. We can all change if we made a mistake and go back to the acknowledging of a precise and correct knowledge before the eyes of the Father that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, which are taken captive by him at his will. That they might recover themselves, or as the Greek says, return to soberness from the intoxication of false doctrine and self-service back to the pure word of truth. The word diabolos, we've talked about that one already, are lust, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. The red is not even in the text. Out of the snare of the diabolos, of diabolos. Taken captive... Only other time that's used is in Luke 5, where it's referred to as catch, as in Jesus said to Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men, when he taught them the concept of drawing out of the Gentile seas to be part of the family of God. I know that was a lot today, and I, according to my notes, I went three minutes over. Sorry, but we are on pace, and we'll finish this letter tomorrow with some cool stuff about Paul and Stephen.